All right, good morning, everyone. So thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, I am Jorge Arce, blockchain and cryptography researcher at Nettermind. Today, I want to tell you guys about some of the work we have been doing uh, alongside Lido. Uh, we, as part of the Nettermind research team, in order to support them in their goal of having a permissionless or moving towards a permissionless operator set for Lido. OK, so I would like to start with sort of like a big picture recap of what what are the fundamental problems behind liquid staking and why, what motivates some of the design choices regarding the security and, and how to make these protocols make sense? I think the main one would be when you're dealing with liquid staking and any form of delegated staking for that matter. So how do you incentivize operators to behave correctly when they are handling delegated stake? Because the issue here is they are taking funds from other parties and they are putting, putting them up to stake. So if they get slashed, for example, uh, these are not their funds that are going to be losing. And, and this like, fundamental change in the incentive structure makes it so that you need a different mechanism to establish trust with the node operators. And whichever mechanism you end up choosing is going to shape how your liquid staking protocol ends up looking, pretty much. So let's go over the two most uh, common approaches for like the main uh, I guess, lines of attack against this problem. Let's start with the case of Rocket Pool, for example. Um, we know that the way Rocket Pool deals, deals with this problem is it's sort of like a 50-50 distribution of the, of the stake between a staking pool and the node operator, right? So the node operator puts up 16 ETH of his or her own collateral, and then the rest of the ETH comes from a pool. This is great in the sense that uh, there are very few centralization or cartelization concerns amongst the different uh, or, or amongst rocket pool validators because they're running independently, they're running permissionlessly. It does have the problem that it is harder to start a new, to spin up a new uh, rocket pool validator in the sense that you need to have that capital available. Now, on the other hand, we can think about an approach like the one Lido follows, which is a whitelisted based approach, where the whitelist is curated and um, chosen by a DAO. <clears throat> this has the great advantage that it's easier to start new validators. Essentially, like a node operator is not going to be limited by his, own, his or her own capital in order to start up new validators. They can pretty much uh, stake all of the funds that they are delegated, uh, as long as their infra allows them to. But it does have the downside, as has been discussed a lot in, the, in, in, this, in this space in the community, of like the centralization and cartelization concerns, what happens if the DAO is taken over, if it takes uh, malicious decisions, or if a malicious vote passes, for example. OK. Um, so here's a chart of Rocket Pool's our ETH deposit pool and its balance as a function of time over the last year. And so what, what this means is this is the stake that is sitting in Rocket Pool waiting to be staked. And so for example, check out after October 2022 all the way down to, well, this month. And you see that the pool has been uh, full for most of the time. This is 5K ETH that's sitting in the pool and has not been able to be staked so far. It's waiting for a node operator to uh, come up with the collateral to spin up a new validator. And so we use this as evidence or as like a supporting point to the fact that decentralization is important for sure, and we definitely should have all liquid staking protocols move towards decentralization. But so is capital efficiency. The ability for a protocol to receive new funds and stake them as quickly as possible is essential for uh, like how well it does in terms of market share, and just how friendly it is to uh, attract new capital. And here's like the current state of affairs regarding staking. We see uh, Lido sitting, I, I scraped this data yesterday, hopefully it's still um, accurate. <laughs> so Lido is sitting at around, uh, roughly 31% of stake and we have a Rocket Pool sitting at a 2.4% of stake. OK, so with that introduction out of the way, we have discussed what is Rocket Pool's approach, what is Lido's approach. We have discussed strengths and weaknesses for both of them. Now let us talk about how we want to move forward and how we want to improve the situation. So the goal that we have in the research team with, um, with Lido 
is for us to design a mechanism that is going to check the following boxes. We kind of want to like get the strengths of both approaches as, in as much as we can. And so we want to design a mechanism that allows nodes to onboard the network without requiring permission from a central authority or governance. It is okay if there's still a whitelist for um, permissioned operators that are allowed to get more stake, for example, but we would like there to be a way for permissionless operators to get in without um, having to, to, to go through this whitelist approach. We want it to not be entirely dependent on bonding. And the reason for this is that uh, when, when we use bonding as the only mechanism to guarantee the correct behavior of uh, our validator set, the capital efficiency goes down. And this is the concept that we were referring to before with this uh, rocket pool chart. And finally, we would like the mechanism to still prevent or mitigate misbehavior of the node operators. OK, so having said that, and trying to get to combine these approaches of, OK, decentralization while keeping capital efficiency as high as possible, what are some of the approaches we can take? And we were brainstorming with, uh, with Lido, and we have some ideas that this is by no means an exhaustive list, because in fact, there's a lot of the research that still needs to be done. But the first things that would come to mind are as follows. If you're not using bonding as your mechanism to establish trust, then it is likely that you will have to rely on some form of, well, identity or reputation that you can use to establish trust with your node operators. And this identity or reputation can come from a variety of places. It can come from data sources, whether within Web3 or outside Web3. Let's even say uh, Web2 sources or even real-world identity sources. If we could find a way to make a mechanism like this work in an automated fashion and in a way that is respectful of privacy as well, then this could be an approach. Um, also, tracking the node performance of operators, our permissionless operators, in order to increase their reputation over time, that's also something we can do. And in the cases where you have a new operator coming into the system and you absolutely cannot establish uh, trust because you don't have enough information on the, on the operator, then you could still use bonding but you don't want to use this as the sole mechanism. Uh, you also want the, the operator to have a way to climb up its way on, on its reputation, on how much trust the protocol has, has in them without having to uh, rely exclusively on bonding for this. And finally, uh, another approach that is, I think it's going to be absolutely beneficial for the entire staking landscape. It's related to the talk we just heard on DVT. DVT can play an amazing role as a buffer against misbehaving operators because if you're able to, for example, pair trusted nodes with untrusted nodes in, in a DVT pool, this can essentially uh, will diminish or nullify the effects of a malicious operator within uh, a validator and the stake it controls. Now, you you could say that there are potential problems if you're using identity and reputation as sources of uh, establishing trust with node operators, and you would be absolutely correct. And two problems that you have to watch out for in particular would be, the first one are, is civils. So if you're using some identity or reputation system, you don't want a party or like an entity, whether this is a person or an organization, you don't want them to control multiple operators behind the scenes. You don't want them to um, spin up a bunch of identities that supposedly belong to different people but are in fact controlled by the same person, get into the protocol, and then get to control much more stake than they actually should. This is a problem if we let it happen. The second problem would be white labeling, in which um, we understand by white labeling having a party that is already a part of our protocol, and it for whatever reason, it doesn't want to run its validator duties, it, and it delegates those duties of like running the infrastructure to another party, uh, the, in this case, the white label operator. And the reason these two things are especially harmful is because we are going to get a, a skewed image of what our validator set is actually when these, if these attacks are successful. We're going to have single points of failure, and we're going to have uh, malicious acts would be much more harmful in the sense that we could have a single party behind the scenes controlling much more stake than they should. Okay. 
So let's put all of the pieces together. Let's talk about the roadmap, a roadmap that would make sense to address all of this. The approaches we are following, or like the step-by-step -step approach we're following here is we're following different phases of research. Uh, the first one would be phase one, in which we looked at the identity problem and what kind of tooling is out there in order to make this happen. And so we uh, did a, a systematization of knowledge for decentralized identities and verifiable credentials. And so this phase was completed late 2022, so last year, and I will tell you guys more about it in a, in a minute. And this is currently where we're at. Phase two on white labeling resistance, which is uh, the stage of the research that we want to undertake next. And for the future, we have planned out uh, civil resistance and how to score or determine the reputation of uh, node operators, and finally, an implementation phase. OK, so let's talk about phase one of the research that has already been completed. So in this, in this phase of the research, we are studying what tools are out there that can be used to bring um, I, to construct an identity mechanism for Lido. And we wanted to look at decentralized identities and verifiable credentials as a way to handle these identities in a way that is as permissionless as possible. So decentralized identities, for example, in the words of the Ethereum Foundation, um, they underlie the idea that identity-related information should be self-controlled, it should be private, it should be portable. So that sounds a lot like what we want to move towards. And regarding verifiable credentials, these are also a crucial piece of the puzzle in the sense that using them, users can prove to a verifier that a set of claims about their identity is true. So verifiable credentials are going to allow you for, to have privacy and to reveal only the necessary identity data that you uh, need to reveal in order to establish trust. OK, let's come back to an approach that we discussed earlier on how we can meaningfully populate these identities in order to uh, identify node operators. And so this is the idea that we can find multiple sources for this identity, whether coming from off-chain or even on-chain, and use them to well, establish the identity of operators. So what could be examples? We have some sources of data in Web3, such as NFTs, soulbound tokens, even like the history of Ethereum accounts. We also have, but we want to like look beyond that and see if there are any valuable so sources of reputation outside the blockchain space that could be bootstrapped into Web3 and be used for our purposes. So think of like Web2 services where people already have reputations related to their technical activities or to their um, influence in the ecosystem. So let's say reputation scores on places like Stack Overflow, stars on GitHub, or Twitter, things like this. Now. We have to be careful if we were to follow this approach because we must use data that cannot be farmed easily, that is rare enough to obtain. And we need to have mechanisms to prevent this sort of, uh, let's say someone decides to start spinning up Twitter accounts just to try to game the mechanism. So we need to have heuristics in place to determine or to uh, prevent this from happening. And finally, the, so the rationale of this idea of how to pull the data on chain in order to uh, populate our identities is, once again, use data that is valuable enough in order to increase civil resistance. And then the challenge here would be, how do you want to pull this data, or how can we pull this data in a verifiable way so that the system is not likely to be exploited? And so what did we check? As part of our systematization of knowledge, we took the work of surveying over 100 academic papers and um, implementations regarding identity. We sorted them in terms of like quality, in terms of relevance to the problem at hand. We looked through them, and we decided to keep 70 of them that were uh, worthy of mention. And so we looked, for example, at verifiable credential schemes from classical papers all the way to the 90s to like more modern approaches. We looked at how to ensure that the user cannot fool the verifier. This is a, a crucial step to guarantee the, the soundness of the protocol. And how to protect the privacy of users as well. On decentralized identities, how to show statements efficiently, how to issue credentials at, in a way that's decentralized, and what implementations are out there that we can use today or that we could get working for our problem with some minimal changes. 
And regarding getting data to Web3, this was, um, if you guys are interested in looking at the deliverable, here's a QR code that's going to take you to it. So we constructed like a database with all the different articles. We have them sorted by year, quality score, relevant score. Uh, we label them according to whatever, um, to, to, the, to the topic that they refer to. And each of the papers has a note by us on how it can be relevant to the problem, what are the merits of each approach, and what are potential downsides as well. All right. And so let me highlight some notable implementations from what we found. Um, we found, for example, Polygon ID, which is a system that allows us to uh, manage identities and also make zero knowledge claims about the identities. We found Sysmo, which is a protocol for the creation of zero knowledge attestations. We found some protocols that already are looking at this problem of how to integrate real world data and pass it over to Web3. And we found protocols like Candid, which uh, proposes a mechanism that can work for identities of people who live in the US. We found EBSI, which is a mechanism that can work for people who live in the European Union. And finally, we found Interrep, which is an anti-civil service that analyzes this problem of having Web2 data or Web2 reputation and bringing it over to Web3. Another of the good pieces of infrastructure that we found that can be useful for this problem is called Deco. So what Deco does is it allows you to get data that is behind, encrypted behind a TLS connection without any TLS modifications to the, to the server side. So it is privacy preserving as well. And the way it does this is when, you're having a TL, when you have a TLS connection with a given service, let's say it could be Twitter, or GitHub, or what have you, then the client side, which is the person that is interacting with the service, can be split into two roles, a prover and a verifier, which is going to be an outside oracle that is auditing this connection. And then the prover and the verifier can perform the client's jobs via secure two-party computation. And in this way, information about what's going on in that uh, Web2 connection can be extracted and uh, verified. So after doing all the research, after looking at all of those articles, what are like our general takeaways on following this identity approach? Well, we have some positives, we have some negatives. Positives are we have interesting projects that are already trying to make verifiable credentials a part of Ethereum. And we have viable approaches to getting Web2 data to Web3, as we have already ascertained. And some of the approaches even go to deal with dealing with real world identities, such as EVSI for the EU, Candid for the US, as I already described. If you would like some more information about this, then uh, I would encourage you to consult the, the deliverable that we were talking about. We also found some negatives. For example, many of the solutions required a centralized issuer. However, there are some solutions that allow you to issue verifiable credentials without a centralized issuer, and we would like to take inspiration on those. There are also some problems with standards for DIDs in the sense that there's not a lot of, there, there's not like consensus on what should be like the implementation guide or standards or guidelines to have like sort of like a common set of tools that looks similar and that we can adapt and, and, and modify if needed. And finally, finally, not many of the projects that we looked at relating regarding to identity try to fight civils. And this is a problem, of course, because uh, an identity approach or reputation approach is going to be very weak to, civil, to civils on its own. So we're going to have to look at this um, angle of the problem on a different phase as well. OK, so that's regarding identity. Now, we haven't looked into the implementation of an identity system yet because, well, there's a variety of reasons. For example, the Lido team is right now very busy working on withdrawals, which is, of course, quite the priority. And also, we want to look at some of these uh, questions from a theoretical point of view before we jump straight into implementation. And now we want to talk about the next one, which would be perhaps the next one in priority, which is white labeling and white labeling resistance. So we currently have a proposal going on on Lido's uh, research forum, and it's currently on Snapshot for the, DAO, uh, for the token holders to vote. 
And in this proposal, we propose a roadmap. I think it's like a 22-week roadmap of research, which is going to look at the following tasks. We want to look at white labeling and, we do, and do a systematization of knowledge on the literature and the relevant approaches that are out there. We also want to look at arbitrary protocols for reasons that I will explain next. Things like decentralized oracles, prediction markets, token curated registries, and decentralized justice. We want to look at how these can be put together to design a resolution mechanism. And finally, how we can have heuristics against civils and white labels. So using off and on chain signals coupled with heuristics or machine learning classifiers even to find uh, probable civils. So what's the deal with arbitrary protocols, which is one of the main lines of, of our research or one of the main things that we're trying to look at here? With arbitrary protocols, the idea is that we could have a settling mechanism that could take evidence that was gathered either from off-chain or on-chain about a given operator being currently a white label. Because these things do get out eventually, and or uh, a motivated investigator can pick up some of the signal. This evidence would then be presented to uh, an arbitrary protocol or some kind of settling mechanism that would look at the evidence and determine whether uh, the operator should be deemed a white label or not. And so examples of protocols or mechanisms that could play this part, apart from like decentralized justice protocols like, let's say, Kleros, are things like prediction markets, where people bet on future events. And so here the idea is that establish the economic incentives for people to tell the truth and to be interested in participating of curating the validator set. Decentralized oracles as well as a way to get all of this off-chain data on-chain, all of this off-chain evidence on-chain. And token curated registries too, where uh, token holders can collectively vote on an enter to be included in the registry for them to once again curate the validator set. Once again, this is all still in, in very early stages, and these have been some of the ideas that the Lido team has been interested in us looking at and that we have been interested uh, of our own volition as well into looking at. And I would like to close this talk with, uh, once again, reminding you that the proposal is currently live. And if you guys are LDO token holders, or if you know any LDO token holders, we would invite you to vote uh, for our proposal. And... Uh, well, what are yes or no, we would like to invite you to participate, to speak your mind, and well, we would definitely appreciate uh, a support, uh, your support, so that we can continue looking into these problems, which I think, especially problems like white labeling and civil resistance, are not as well understood, or they do not have as many solutions or tooling available for us in the Web3 space, and whatever we build, we would hope and whatever we research would hope would benefit uh, not only Lido, but the Ethereum community as well. So once again, I just want to close this with a call to action to all LDO holders. We would very much appreciate your support.